morning. Welcome to worship at um, Peace Lutheran Port Ludlow. Uh, we're glad that you joined us here today on our second Sunday of Epiphany. Um, today we'll be talking about being known and uh, talk a little bit about Spicoli Meat and Mick Jagger and uh, talk about how God knows us. Um, so again, we thank you for joining us and let us begin our worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose voice is upon the waters, whose mercy is poured out upon all people, whose goodness cascades over all creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin, trusting in the abundant grace of God. Holy God, you search us and know us. You are acquainted with all our ways. We confess that our hearts are burdened by sin our own sins and the broken systems that bind us. We turn inward, failing to follow your outward way of love. We distrust those who are not like us. We exploit the earth and its resources and fail to consider generations to come. Forgive us, gracious God, for all we have done and left undone. Even before the words are on our tongues, you know them. Receive them in your divine mercy. Amen. How vast is God's grace through the power and promise of Christ Jesus. Our sins are washed away and we are claimed as God's own beloved. Indeed, we are forgiven in the wake of God's forgiveness. We are called to be beloved community, living out Christ's justice and the Spirit's reconciling peace. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you.
Let us pray. Thanks be to you, Lord Jesus Christ, most merciful Redeemer, for the countless blessings and benefits you give. May we know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly, day by day praising you with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from the book of 1 Samuel. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel, and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli, and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time. And he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house, from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever, for the iniquity that he knew, because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, he said, here I am. Eli said, what was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything, and hid nothing from him. Then he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Search me out, O oh Lord, you have known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You trace my journeys and my resting places and are acquainted with all my ways. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips, but you, O oh Lord, know it all together. You encompass me behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. 
that knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain to it. For you yourself created my inmost parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will, I will thank, thank you because, because I am marvelously made. Your works, works are wonderful, and I know it well. My body was not hidden from you. While I was being made in secret and woven in the depths of the earth. Your, Your eyes beheld my lips. lips. Yet unfinished in the womb, all of them were written in your book. My days were fashioned before they came to be. How deep I find your thoughts, O oh God! How great is the sum of them! If I were to count them, they would be more in number than the sand. To count them all, my lifespan would need to be like yours. The second reading is from the book of 1 Corinthians. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is meant not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord, and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ, and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said, the two shall be one flesh, but anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body, but the fornicator sins against the body itself. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own. For you were brought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Word of God, Word of Life. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. 
Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I think one of our greatest desires and needs as people is to be known, to be known by those closest to us, our family, to be known by our friends, to be known by our communities, be known by our partners or those that we engage with out in the public, our workmates, to be known by perhaps even uh, outside of our community and out in uh, places as far as we can get, we desire to be known, I think. Social media plays a big part of that, for better or for worse, really. We have this strong desire to be known, and so we uh, desire to share that on social media. And so this, this innate uh, desire to be known, I believe, is rooted in our desire to be known by God. And there's a movie called Fast Times at Ridgemont High that came out a long, long time ago, but you might remember it, it's a high school in Los Angeles area and um, in the early 80s. And at the beginning, as they're introducing the characters, one of the main characters, Jeff Spicoli, who's the surfer guy played by Brad Pitt, he comes into the restaurant that's run by one of the other guys with the surfer buddies and they walk past the sign that says, no shirt, no shoes, no service. So they go and they sit down and then they take their shirts off and then they begin to decide what they're going to get. So they empty their pockets out onto the table. And I remember these days you go to the beach, you didn't have, you didn't bring anything with you. You're starving at the end and you don't usually have much with you, just what you could scrounge in the ashtray in your pockets. And so they put it all out on the table and they go looking through it and uh, Spicoli puts a guitar pick out there and one of those buddies asked him I didn't know he played guitar and Spicoli and his surfers always like I went to the Stones concert remember he says I don't play guitar he says the Anaheim Stones concert see I go backstage and I'm like walking around looking all over and who do I see it's Mick so I cruise on over and going to meet the man you know, and as I get over there, he says, Hey, bro, what's your name? And I go, Jeff Spicoli, dude. Good to meet you. And he goes, Good to meet you, Jeff. And he does this all Gentile-like. And, uh, and and that's what uh, Spicoli says. And, um, and that's what we see sort of in our gospel lesson, in a way, is we see this meeting of uh, somebody coming to meet Jesus. And... Just like Jeff Spicoli, when the person arrives to meet Jesus, it isn't them that reaches out or that initiates the conversation. It is Jesus that initiates the conversation with Nathaniel and Philip, just as Mick Jagger and Jeff Spicoli's story reaches out to know him. And so we start this passage back in John, and uh, because Mark is, you know, a pretty brief book compared to the other Gospels, we use John a lot during this um, portion of the church year. And um, so the Gospel of John, we pick back up, and this would just be right after uh, the time that um, John the Baptist was introducing Jesus. And then the next day, Jesus goes and he begins to gather his disciples. And uh, earlier in this chapter, just the passage before, it would have been um, Jesus meets Andrew, who is one of John the Baptist's disciples. And so Andrew goes and he meets Jesus and he runs and grabs Peter to come up and meet Jesus. And so Peter meets Jesus there. And then the next day it says that um, Jesus goes and he finds Philip. And he says, follow me. And Philip immediately begins to follow him. And Philip's from the same town, Bethsaida, that Andrew and um, Peter, Simon, are from. So there would be a connection there. And so they probably know each other. And then so Philip goes and gets one of his friends. And we see how the beginning of a ministry starts. This ministry of Jesus, the first 
church plant is Jesus grabbing these friends and these people and these acquaintances and other people that would find interest in him and gathering them together, those who would follow him. And so Philip goes and he talks to Nathaniel and he tells uh, Nathaniel that who's from Cana. So Nathaniel probably would have been uh, familiar with who Jesus was. It wasn't far away. Uh, he probably would have been, you know, if there was a wedding in Cana, a good likelihood that Nathaniel would have seen what Jesus did at the wedding or at least been somewhat aware of what might have happened. So Phil comes down to Nathaniel and tells him, the one that our prophets have spoken of, the one whom Moses and our prophets have spoken of is here, the Messiah. He is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. And Nathaniel says, get out of here, get out of here. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Now we often talk about that. That's a common, common, common um, you know, saying in the Bible, can anything good come out of Nazareth? It points to Jesus being up in Galilee, outside of Jerusalem, being out in the sticks, being uh, kind of from backward folk. But Nathaniel was from somewhat of the same area. He was from Cana. That's up there as well. And what I think Nathaniel's saying is, come on, come on. He's the skeptical one. Come on. The Messiah isn't going to come from people like us. The Messiah doesn't come from people like us, from places that we come from. The Messiah is an important person. He's not like us. And so um, Philip says, no, 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 come and see. And he brings him up to Jesus. And as they're walking towards Jesus, just as Spicoli is walking towards Mick Jagger, before Nathaniel can even say anything, Jesus says, now there is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And so Nathaniel says, how would you even know me? How did you know that? How do you know me? How do you know who I am? And Jesus says, well, of course I know you. I saw you sitting under the fig tree over there. And Nathaniel says, you say that about me just by seeing me under a fig tree and Jesus says Nathaniel and he, and this is where it gets really interesting and he says Nathaniel you will see the angels descending upon the son of man from heaven and this harkens back to Jacob and if you remember the story of Jacob there's a, a many good stories with Jacob in Genesis but uh, one of the main ones is as he's on his way to uh, go to Laban's to get in that finagle with his wives. He's on his way there and he uh, stops and rests. And it's a place that Abraham had been before and pitched his tent. And it's the place that God had promised Abraham. And Jacob was resting there and sleeping at night and he had a dream. And in this dream, he sees a ladder and you might be familiar with the story Jacob's ladder and he sees this ladder that goes up to heaven and he sees the angels of the Lord coming ascending and descending upon it what Jesus does when he talks to Nathaniel here is he lets Nathaniel know I know who you are Nathaniel I know that you are an Israelite amongst the Israelites. And this would have been important to somebody like Nathaniel, because if you remember in um, church history or in uh, biblical history that the kingdom of Israel was had become, there was one kingdom and then it became separate. And it became, there was the Northern kingdom, which was Israel and the Southern kingdom, which was Judah. And um, during that time, that they were divided. Eventually, uh, Syria, Assyria came down and uh, took uh, all of the northern kingdom away and scattered them throughout the Assyrian Empire. And that was their most common way of dealing with places that they conquered is they would grab portions of people and just disper disperse them all through their empire so they didn't have any way of really working well together to take on the powers to try to destroy 
their cultures. But here was Nathaniel, and he goes all the way back. He is an Israelite in which there is no deceit. And, and my guess is that's something that he would have cherished himself as being. He would have looked at that as something of being of, this is um, a very important to me. And I remember, you know, this, uh, you might remember last year when I first was starting there, I talked about how I just had found out that I had come from French heritage and I didn't even know that. And this reminded me of that very similar thing. And what I found as I began to read about this group of people that I come from, these Huguenots, these French Protestants, it's not just the personal character characteristics of being French and, you know, kind of the good and the bad that comes with that. Uh, not just um, all the strange things that happen, such as my dogs that are from 12 kilometers from the town that are, you know, my family was had their, you know, established place in Ypres, France. It wasn't just that sort of weird stuff. But it was also this idea of the refugee aspect. Now, the term refugee actually comes from this group of people that uh, my family on my mom's side um, is descended from. And the reason I talk about that is that being mainly my family is because on my mom's side, my grandparents were actually related. So that kind of messes with the genetics quite a bit. Now, uh, they weren't super closely related, but they also weren't super separately <laughs> related. So, you know, and, and as I talk to my brother about that, you know, it's kind of an interesting thing. But, um, you know, but they, you know, I guess that was known by the family, but not known by me. But anyways, those genetics are our genetics. And my brother took one of those DNA tests and it came out strong. And we were totally unaware. And as I looked into this group of people, these French Protestants, they were very influential in the establishment of America. You think of some of the great thinkers like Rousseau and Locke and some of the great people in the revolution like uh, Paul Revere or afterwards in um, Daniel Boone or Davy Crockett. These instrumental um, influential people in America were actually not English, but this group of French people, but one thing that happened is they discarded their French names. They had no church. Most of them, once they got to a, you know, by the time the families got to America, completely lost their faith and were so secular. It was so unknown that when I called my mom, she had no idea that we were even French, let alone come from a pretty well established, various well established French Protestant families. But as I look at my family and I think about that side, I think about my brother and my aunt, my mom and my grandma, my grandpa, and of course, remember they're related. Um, you see the, the refugee, you see the searching without finding, you see the people who don't really have a home to call their own. You know, the, there's a military aspect to my family and that, uh, that no home part about it is, is a huge, aspect of who we are and that's what we see with nathaniel you see nathaniel was from a people like i am that were scattered they were scattered throughout uh, all of the middle east all of the fertile crescent they went all the way up into um, eastern europe and then over to europe during that time these people are scattered throughout the world these israelites and here was one that was still sitting there, that was looking and searching in that same area that Jacob had come, that Abraham had come, that had been promised to them. And he's waiting and he's hoping and he's clinging to this uh, ideal identity of who he is. And Jesus says, there's one with no deceit. And when you look at the, um, the northern kingdom, if you remember what happened, this place Bethel would become its religious center, this place where Jacob had that dream. It would become their religious center, and uh, Jeroboam would went and he uh, set up a golden calf, of all things, to worship. 
And so as the northern kingdom was uh, growing and flourished, this became their center and they became an idolatrous nation. They became a nation that uh, chased after uh, different gods. Yet there were still some, after all the dispersion, after all the time, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, the coming and going of the northern kingdom, the re, the Babylon taking over of the, uh, or the southern kingdom and, and exiling everybody up to Babylon, and then their return. All these things happened in 400 years, then the Greeks, and then the Romans. And there's still this man, this young man, Nathaniel, clinging to that hope and promise. And Jesus says, Nathaniel, you're pure. And you will see that promise um, carried out right before your eyes. And if you remember that promise, it says this in Genesis. He, uh, the Lord speaking to Jacob says, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give you and your offspring. And your offspring shall be like dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Jesus hearkens back to this promise to Jacob, to Israel, that thing that Nathaniel is clinging to and saying, you will see this fulfilled before your eyes. Because what Jesus is saying here is that I am the ladder to heaven. I am the way that um, the angels come from heaven and go up to heaven. I am that bridge. And Jesus is saying, this promise will be fulfilled. This land will be yours, but it's not going to look like you think. It's going to take uh, years and generations. And there's going to be heartache because there is no way to scatter a blessing without heartache. There's no way to scatter people without some sort of uh, calamity to send them away. And this promise that God will restore them is still valid and it's still valid today that God promises all these things, not only to them, but to us in our baptism, that God says that I love you. I know you. You are my beloved. As we uh, heard last week, when God said that Jesus was his beloved, that means that we are God's beloved and he knows us. And God knows what you're going through. God knows the uh, concerns you have today. God um, knows the concerns you have for our nation, how you may be looking and thinking, uh, how can the promise of this place be fulfilled, the promise of the United States of America be fulfilled when we're having such great strife and things seem so out of whack to what we're accustomed to? God says, I have a promise for you. You are secure in me. I know you. I truly love you. And I think the hard part about that is often and maybe you know in various relationships, especially as parents and things like that, we know that um, sometimes God loves us in a way that we don't see it or recognize it. And God cares for us. Um, even in these times of pain and hurt, that God has a purpose. And maybe that purpose isn't um, evident right now, but it will be. And you see that as um, these people were scattered, these Israelites, that they have gone to the north and the south and the east, and they have been a blessing to the world. And that is God's ultimate hope for our planet, is that as we are called in similar fashion, is that we would receive um, God, the gospel, um, this message from God that we are loved and cared for, that we receive um, this identity of belonging, and then we are sent into this world to heal it, 
to help put it back together, to help let it know that it is known and cared for. And these people that we see and that we meet in our daily lives to share this same concern and desire to know and love and comfort. I'll close with these words from the psalm. And, you know, if it's, these are one of the hardest things, I think, for us as believers to hold on to, is for us to th believe that God knows us and can still care about us. In the words, he says, Oh, Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot contain or cannot attain it. You see, this idea of being known by God is such a lofty concept that we can't even fully attain it. And so we are reminded um, through our worship, we are reminded through the sacraments as we receive the body and blood of Christ that God is with us, present, his body, Christ's body in us to be his people in his world. Amen.
Join with me today as we recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father, the Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Guided by Christ, made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. For the body of Christ, gathered throughout the world, and for all servants of the gospel, that following Jesus, the church lives out its calling every day, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For the well-being of creation, for plants and animals, and for all that God has marvelously made, that we serve as wise stewards of earth, our home, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For police officers and firefighters, for attorneys and paralegals, for peacekeepers and military personnel, and for the leaders of governments, that they provide protection to all people, especially the most vulnerable, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For those lacking food or shelter, for those who are sick or grieving, and for those who are imprisoned or homebound, that God console all who suffer, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. Joining us for the first time or returning, and for those absent from our assembly, that all who seek to know God are nourished by word and sacrament, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. In thanksgiving for the saints who have gone before us, especially Antony and Pacomius, renewers of the church, that their lives give us a vision of the gospel in action, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, receive these gifts as you receive us, like a mother receives her child, with arms open wide. Nourish us anew in your tender care, and empower us in faithful service to tend to others with this same love, through Jesus Christ, our saving grace. Amen. The Lord be with you. 
And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death in the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, you have brought us this far along the way. In times of bitterness, you did not abandon us, but guided us into the path of love and light. In every age, you sent the prophets to make known your loving will for all humanity. The cry of the poor has become your own cry. Our hunger and thirst for justice is your own desire. In the fullness of time, you sent your chosen servant to preach good news to the afflicted, to break bread with the outcast and despised, and to ransom those in bondage to prejudice and sin. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ is died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering, therefore, his death and resurrection, we await the day when Jesus shall return to free all the earth from the bonds of slavery and death. Come, Lord Jesus, and let the church say amen. Send your Holy Spirit, our advocate, to fill the hearts of all who share this bread and cup with courage and wisdom to pursue love and justice in all the world. Come, Spirit of Freedom, and let the church say, Amen. Join our prayers and praise with your prophets and martyrs of every age, that rejoicing in the hope of the resurrection, we might live in the freedom and hope of your Son, through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Beloved, here is the bread, here is the wine, here is Jesus. All are welcome, all are welcome to partake of this supper, the bread and wine, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. The body of Christ given for you. Amen. 
the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. Let us pray. Christ Jesus, at this table we have feasted on your very life and are strengthened for our journey. Send us forth from this banquet, nourished in body and in spirit, to proclaim your good news and serve others in your name. Amen. Gracious God, loving all your family with a mother's tender care, as you sent the angel to feed Elijah with heavenly bread, Assist those who set forth to share your word and sacrament with those who are sick, homebound, and imprisoned. In your love and care, nourish and strengthen those who will receive this sacrament, and give us all the comfort of your abiding presence. Through the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God the Creator strengthen you, Jesus the Beloved fill you, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter keep you in peace. Amen.
And now, go in peace. Be the light of Christ. Thanks be to God. Thank you.